So I'm uh, Chris Malozzi, one of the cardiologists over at uh, University Hospital. Uh, I would like to thank you guys for coming this afternoon to this lecture series. I want to thank the organizers for allowing me to come back. I had the privilege of doing this last year during February. This was uh, February's the American Heart Association's kind of uh, Heart Health Awareness Month, especially for women. So last year, if you were here, I talked about women and cardiovascular disease. So this year, I'm going to spice it up a little bit differently and talk about another uh, health problem that affects predominantly women and breast cancer and how it relates to heart disease. So hopefully uh, this will provide you some insight, uh, maybe uh, some things you didn't know about before, uh, and hopefully you learn something. So as far as disclosures, I don't get paid anything to do this. This is kind of a standard thing that us physicians have to say when we give talks like this. I also don't have any oncology training, so the stuff that I talk about as far as breast cancer treatment is just things that I've learned working with my colleagues and patients and, and lectures and things that I've attended. So I just have cardiovascular disease training, so no cancer training specifically. So before we get started, uh, if anyone who's willing to answer this, how many people in the room have either had have or know someone who has had breast cancer? Okay. How about heart disease? The, all, I'm sure everybody's hands. Okay, so we're in the right place there. All right. So the objectives for today's talk, we're going to briefly go over just some background information about breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, public awareness. I'll show you a brief video. Um, we'll also talk about the cardiovascular effects of common breast cancer treatments. We'll explore a relationship that occurs between breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. We'll spend a little bit of time about risk factors and why they're important, and hopefully by the end you'll see why that is important. And if we have any time at the very end, I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce a concept called cardio-oncology. So first we're going to talk about these two major public health problems, breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. I'm going to throw out a lot of graphs. Many of them we won't spend a whole lot of time. There's a lot of scientific <laughs> graphs and things. I'm using them as visual aids to drive home some points. And the other comment I want to make is that some of the things I talk about, because a lot of you raised your hand, I don't want the information that I'm going to share with you to scare you in any way as far as heart disease and breast cancer goes. I really want it to empower you so that you know uh, you have more information so that you can take uh, better care of yourself uh, if you identify any areas that you need to do so. Um, so let's get back to the graph. So as, for as long as people have probably jotted down statistics of these types of things, heart disease and cancer have always led the race as far as the leading causes of death, pretty much you know, definitely in our country and, and across the world. And there's really no, there's a big gap between second and third place. So these two things uh, run rampant and uh, take a lot of lives over the course of, uh, of time. And this is just numbers from 2015 and 2016. So you can see that these two, these two disease processes are very prevalent. As specifically for women, the same holds true uh, across all age groups, all types of cardiovascular disease and all types of cancers tend to lead the race as far as what causes cardiovascular mortality in women as well as breast cancer mortality in women. Now the nice thing about this graph is over the last couple of decades, We've seen an increase in the rise of diagnosis of breast cancer, and that probably uh, goes along with the increased efforts in awareness and screening and mammography and just the overall uh, public uh, initiative to make this, uh, this health problem so um, at the forefront of uh, women's health. Uh, and we also see by this graph that deaths from breast cancer are also on the decline. So even though the numbers have gone up over the years, uh, we are still doing a very good job uh, treating breast cancer to where we're seeing a steady decline uh, in death from the problem. Cardiovascular disease, again, huge major health problem. It affects almost 50 million women, specifically. One in 3.3 deaths in, in women is due to cardiovascular disease, and it costs the healthcare community a ton of money, $272.5 billion. Breast cancer, uh, obviously also important, um, affects about 3.32 million women. One in 31 and a half deaths are uh, specifically attributed to the cancer. And again, big medical costs, not as much as cardiovascular disease, but uh, 16.5 billion annually in the cost uh, and treatment of this uh, problem. So what about here at home? So I don't have the updated numbers, but in 2017, Mitchell Cancer Institute across the street gave me some information about their breast cancer patients. 
In that year, they saw about 1,500 unique breast cancer patient visits. 235 of those patients were newly diagnosed, and that's just at Mitchell Cancer Institute. That doesn't count for Southern Cancer Center or any of the other places here in the region. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty big number if you ask me. So we know that uh, as far as public awareness goes, um, I already talked about February being American Heart Health Awareness Month, especially for women. So in February we go red, everyone wears their red dress. There's lots of uh, promotional things that go on in this month to raise awareness for heart disease. Breast cancer has its own month. October is go pink, if you will. So people uh, in October, we, do our we focus our efforts on raising awareness for breast cancer and breast cancer treatment. So these things are very important because not only is it in the front line of the medical professional's eyes, it's also being brought to the patient uh, and the general population makes it into the news. It's talked about in magazines. So it's obviously something that's, that's rampant and we need to be aware of. And I think we've done a good job over the years promoting this awareness. And I'm going to show you a brief video that goes, uh, that kind of, I think, is, it introduces this idea of a female who is diagnosed with breast cancer and is so focused on the breast cancer treatment that the cardiovascular problems that may, uh, that we'll talk about later in, in this hour, uh, the cardiovascular problems are kind of ignored. Um, so I'm going to show, share this with you. It's about a minute and a half. Treatments that save women like Connie Hagen from breast cancer may also damage their hearts, says the first major report on the link between the two diseases. We have never talked about what it was doing to our heart. So I was in a state of shock. Today, the American Heart Association said women over age 65 are more likely to die from heart disease than breast cancer. Doctors warn three to four months of chemo and radiation can cause heart failure and patients to gain 10 pounds and lose 30% of their fitness. Having the conversation early about the cardiovascular risk makes all the difference. And that's why prevention is a key. Today is Connie's first appointment with Dr. Susan Gilchrist, who runs the nation's first clinic for breast cancer patients to treat cardiac risk like high blood pressure and obesity with a healthy diet and exercise. I have a grandson for the first time, so I want to be around to experience some of the years in his life. While doctors agree the benefit of cancer treatment still outweighs the risks, the message today, be sure to take care of your heart, too. Rahima Ellis, NBC News, New York. All right, so you can imagine that, you know, that video comes out on NBC Nightly News and probably thousands or millions of women see that video and they're like, oh my goodness, my heart could be, you know, they, whether that was a relatively over-dramatized or not, I'm going to share with you some of the information that goes behind that uh, video. And as a matter of fact, just a few weeks ago, I was at a conference related to this and I had the opportunity to listen to some lectures from Dr. Gilchrist, who works at MD Anderson specifically to do cardiovascular care in, in women. So uh, that was quite an honor for me. But you can imagine now we've got the, this story in the news, these women with breast cancer, now they're worried about their, the side effects or the treatment uh, effects, and now they're worried about heart disease on top of it. And it's not just in video or on the news. It gets its way into business or science magazines, like I have here, that cardiovascular statement that they released from the American Heart Association. Um, you know, U.S. News putting out the wonder drug's frightening side effect. I'll talk about Herceptin a little later in the talk. But just to give you an idea that this relationship between the cardiovascular disease aspect and not just breast cancer but all cancer treatments has led to the development of this working relationship between cardiologists and oncologists. And I'll hit that at the very end. So the good news is that over time, uh, uh, Shout out to my primary care physician colleagues, cardiologists like myself. We're doing a really good job in treating heart disease to where we see that cardiovascular disease mortality, as you can see in this graph, in both males and females, continues to decline. At the same time, uh, shout out to the oncologists and all the researchers who develop all of these new therapies. Cancer mortality is also decreasing. The other thing is, uh, which is uh, a very important thing to recognize, is as we, pr as we advance in these two fields, survivorship of all different kinds of cancers is rapidly, rapidly improving. 
Right now, around 2016, there are roughly 15 and a half million cancer survivors of all types living in the United States, and it's projected to get up to 26.1 million survivors in the year 2040. So that's uh, something to, uh, that we should applaud, actually. We're doing a really good job at treating these things. But I mentioned this relationship between cardiovascular disease and all types of cancers. Now this is data out of children who they have followed for many years, so survivors of, of childhood cancers. Compared to the patient who has no cancer and no cardiovascular disease, survivorship is limited in these patients who develop cardiovascular disease. So you can see that if you have no cancer and no cardiovascular disease, your survival is pretty much just like anyone else's. Once you develop cancer without cardiovascular disease, the cancer drops you down a notch. Your non-cancer patient who has cardiovascular disease, they're dropped a notch. And when you put the two together, that's the lowest survival curve out of all of them. So we really have to be paying attention to this relationship. So we're gonna switch gears just for a second and talk about some effects of breast cancer therapy specifically. This is just a, a generalized schematic about the overall approaches to how breast cancer is treated. In the early stage patient, so not a metastatic uh, disease patient, there's really two different general types of, of therapy. You can get surgery first, and then have what's called adjuvant systemic therapy, which is pretty much chemotherapy, plus or minus radiation. And then depending on the type of tumor that you have pathologically, they can add some different medications, and we'll talk briefly about that later. The other approach is what they call neoadjuvant, which means you get medication first, then you have surgery, then you might get more medication or chemotherapy, plus or minus radiation. And then in the metastatic disease patient, sometimes these uh, diseases are caught too late, it's too advanced. There's really not a chance for a cure in some cases, and those patients may just get palliative uh, chemotherapy for an extended period of time. So two, two different uh, um, treatment paradigms here, um, but um, either each of these treatments has different exposures that we'll talk about uh, in the next few slides. So some overarching themes as far as, as far as cardiovascular effects of cancer therapy. They can occur early in the course of your treatment for cancer and they can occur late, and we, we call these cardiotoxicities. Uh, this is just a general list of a lot of the things that have been identified, not specifically for breast cancer therapies, but all different types of cancers. I've highlighted uh, in italics overt heart failure because that's one of the ones that has been well known for some uh, cancer treatment, specifically in breast cancer. So we'll, we'll hit that a few different times. You'll hear me talk a little bit about heart failure. Subclinical LV dysfunction is when you have uh, a drop in the ability of your heart or the ventricle to pump blood forward, but you don't quite yet have symptoms where anyone would pick up on the disease unless we were looking with imaging like ultrasounds of your heart. Hypertension can be a side effect of medications, arrhythmias or electrical problems. QT prolongation is just uh, another form of kind of an, an arrhythmia or a conduction problem. Myocardial ischemia or heart attacks. Valvular heart disease, especially with radiation to the chest. Thromboembolic disease just means blood clots. Uh, and then myocarditis or pericarditis, which are inflammation of either the heart muscle in, the, in myocarditis or the sac that holds the heart uh, in, per, in uh, pericarditis. So there's a lot of different uh, side effects that can occur. The table in this slide just goes to show you that each of these different classes of medicines, and we're not gonna go over the whole, the whole table, I promise, but some different classes of medicines are known to be related to certain cardiovascular side effects. The ones that we're gonna talk about specifically for breast cancer today are gonna to be the chemotherapy, specifically anthracyclines. I'll share a little bit of information on that. That's been used for a very, very long time and has probably the most uh, knowledge and data around uh, cardiac issues. We'll talk uh, a little bit about uh, the anti-HER2 uh, therapies or targeted biologic therapies such as Herceptin, and I'll talk briefly about radiation treatment as well. Those are probably the top three uh, that relate to uh, breast cancer therapy. Before we go into that, these next two slides just kind of give you some background of some symptoms uh, and signs that heart disease may be present, just so you guys are all up to speed with what we might be looking for. Heart failure, classic symptoms, shortness of breath, coughing or wheezing, fluid or swelling, um, feeling tired, lightheaded when you otherwise shouldn't be, nauseous or lack of appetite, feeling confused, and maybe your heart rate is uh, up. 
Common signs of a heart attack, although if you were here last year, uh, women don't often have the classic signs uh, of heart attacks. Uh, however, uh, you know, substernal or classic chest discomfort in the center of your chest, jaw or neck pain, discomfort in your shoulders, and you can see that some of these symptoms uh, are similar between these two particular heart problems and actually are pretty common amongst the majority of cardiovascular problems. So keep these things in mind uh, as we talk about uh, cardiovascular disease in the coming slides. Again, not going to go through all the details of this graphic either, but this graph shows you the stages of congestive heart failure. We have different stages and most of the time when people become symptomatic from their heart failure, we label them as stage C. So those people usually have a pumping problem and have developed some of those symptoms and they come to uh, the clinic or they come to the emergency room or get admitted to the hospital and then we know that they have developed uh, heart failure from whatever cause. This is not specific to cancer patients. What I do want to outline is that stage A here in the chart specifically is identifying those patients who are at risk for developing heart failure. And they list this generic term of cardiotoxins. And when you refer to the, the text where this graphic comes out of, chemotherapy, radiation, those sorts of things are lumped into this cardiotoxin uh, arena. So someone who's going through cancer treatment, whether it's breast cancer or otherwise, depending what medications they've received, they're already a stage A heart failure patient before they've ever developed problems with their heart or ever developed symptoms. So just keep that in mind as something else uh, to think about as we go forward. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time about the mechanisms of how these medicines work. Uh, I told you I'd cover a couple of them today. Anthracyclines have been around for a long, long time. They're pretty much the mainstay in breast cancer treatment, the mainstay in solid tumor treatment, such as uh, sarcomas and lymphomas, and leukemias. Uh, obviously, a lot of the childhood uh, cancer patients have leukemia, and anthracyclines are used in these patients as well. Most patients uh, don't recall uh, their medications, maybe because they can't pronounce them. Uh, I can't pronounce half of them either. Uh, but if you ask someone, hey, did you get that red medicine while you were getting treated for your cancer? That, that's one of the most common ones, the red devil, uh, so to speak. That's doxorubicin. Uh, that's one of the classic adriamycin or anthracyclines that are used in breast cancer treatment and is well known to be associated with the development of cardiomyopathy or heart failure uh, as a result of it. So really what happens is the medication does its job, as you can see in the graphic here, on the slide, you give someone doxorubicin, it affects uh, how the cancer cell's DNA, uh, it affects the DNA, it signals the cell to die, hopefully, you want the cancer cells to die, but it's not only specific to the cancer cells. Sometimes it can affect other cells in the body, leading to these other things here that we won't go into details about what all of these are, um, but these can also cause problems with normal cells, especially um, myocytes or heart muscle cells. And we know from lots and lots of studies on patients over time that there is really no safe dose of anthracycline. You can have uh, cardiomyopathy or heart failure or, or cardiotoxicity even after a very first dose of anthracycline. We also know that the more and more anthracyclines you get over time, the higher your risk of developing heart failure then or down the line. Now this is important because there's a cutoff here where we see this gigantic jump up around the 250 milligrams per meter squared mark. This is important because most of the treatments nowadays, as things get better and better and better, we've cut down a lot of the doses of these medications, so most of the breast cancer therapies fall on this side. On the other hand, a lot of the childhood cancers end up on this side. So this is a big thing. We still have to pay attention to it, and again, uh, just because you may have received two milligrams per meter squared of doxycycline doesn't mean you're completely out of the woods, but it obviously is uh, a lot different than someone who's had four or five or 600. Uh, so keep this uh, cutoff in mind. Again, most of the breast cancer therapies nowadays fall into this range here. Uh, so we've done a very good job of trying to limit the exposure uh, to the heart uh, so that we limit the cardiotoxicity uh, lifelong. Along with anthracycline therapy, so this is the part of the talk where I said, don't, I'm not trying to scare you, but I have a lot of slides here that so, show you bad news, so I apologize for that. But if you look at anthracyclines uh, in addition to other therapies, and in this slide specifically radiation treatment, you can see that the cumulative incidence of heart failure, and again, this slide I took from uh, the childhood cancer population, so 
but the, the trend is probably similar in the adult. The cumulative incidence of heart failure in someone who has had, who is a sibling of someone who had treatment, so they don't have uh, radiation or anthracyclines. Here they sit down here uh, with a very low incidence of heart failure. When you add uh, radiation treatment or anthracyclines individually, your increased risk of heart failure goes up. And look what happens when you combine the two. And this is specifically radiation that includes the heart in the field of treatment. If you had radiation on your foot, it's not necessarily going to affect your heart. So this is specifically uh, getting a cardiotoxic medication along with radiation that, that involves uh, the heart muscle. Switch gears again, just to ever so slightly, to the HER2 targeted therapies. Uh, this is, uh, the classic one is Herceptin, uh, which is often used in breast cancer treatment. HER2 stands for Human Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor 2. So this is important because 25% of breast cancers, so those patients who get diagnosed with breast cancer, the tissue gets sent away, some tests are run on it to see what kind of pathologic uh, uh, criteria the, the cells themselves have, and 25% of those breast cancers will have this receptor on the cell surface. Now this is extremely important because the development of an antibody to that receptor to help treat <coughs> breast cancer of this type um, is very important, uh, and that's what Herceptin is. So this, these types of breast cancers are known to be very proliferative uh, and, and have higher metastatic potential than those that are not HER2 positive. So the development of trastuzumab or Herceptin has actually reduced the recurrence of cancer in these types of patients by 50% and cut down the mortality by 33%. Now that's very important because this is potentially a curative medication, uh, but it also is known to potentially cause heart failure. In this case, many of the times, this type of heart failure is reversible, uh, but it is known to cause symptomatic heart failure in approximately 4% of patients who receive it. And in a bigger study, maybe up to as many as 30% of patients may have a decline in their pump function, even though it might be small, but they might not have symptoms. So that'll be that subclinical LV dysfunction patient. So her Herceptin, obviously something we pay attention to, and as a matter of fact, we have an algorithm or a guideline that goes along with Herceptin management to where we have to use echocardiograms or MUGA scans to look at, or, or MRIs in some cases, to look at the pumping power of the heart as the patient is going through therapy. So I'm not going to belabor this big long chart and go through each step, but I do want to point out the four circles. I mentioned how important this medicine is in the treatment of breast cancer and the benefits that patients get from it. We really want to be able to recognize or identify the patients who are having trouble so that we can maybe potentially do something to uh, improve their pump function or avoid this problem because in these four circles, we're either holding potentially curative therapy or in some cases having to stop it before they've completed treatment. So this can become very important and that's where the, the relationship between the cardiologist and oncologist uh, becomes uh, uh, essential. So what patients are at the highest risk for developing cardiotoxicity with especially related to the medicines that I've talked about already? So I already mentioned the higher the dose of anthracycline or doxorubicin that you get puts you at risk. The higher the dose of radiation, you can imagine the same, uh, especially when the heart is again in the field of treatment. If you've had both radiation and uh, chemotherapy, that are, that's cardiotoxic and you put those together in either sequential treatment or combination therapy at the same time, or if you're older at the time of your diagnosis of cancer, or if you have cardiovascular disease risk factors. So this is one, one of the, the uh, first glances where cardiovascular disease risk factors, which is another segment of this talk, become very important in identifying in patients who are undergoing cancer treatment. So if you have more than two or equal to two cardiovascular disease risk factors during or you develop them after your cancer treatment, and these include the classics, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, obesity, tobacco use, that increases your risk of having a problem related to cancer treatment. And obviously, if you already have cardiovascular disease before you get diagnosed, your risk is also high. And this includes prior heart attack, valvular heart disease, or if you already have heart failure before you start treatment. Briefly, a discussion on radiation therapy in breast cancer. This is most often used in the post-operative setting. 
So after patients have received their treatment and then in some cases have had surgery, they get radiation to the area. And I won't go into all the details of radiation because I don't know all that much about all those details, but there are many, many different things that have developed over the years to limit the exposure to surrounding tissues. Uh, and they can target the, the cancer bed or the cancer cells specifically. So they've done a lot of things over the years to kind of take that burden of radiation off the heart but sometimes it's, it's a necessary evil, especially when the breast cancer is on the left side. But using adjuvant radiation therapy has been shown to reduce the risk of local recurrence by about 75%, so it's very important. The biggest side effects of radiation are gonna be inflammation caused by the radiation or fibrosis. So the slide here shows you a cross section of an artery that has been exposed to radiation, and you can see all this stuff right here is just inflammation and fibrosis, and this wedge-shaped area here is the opening that's left for blood flow. So we have to pay attention uh, to these things. And some of the scientific stuff of how this goes on, the radiation causes cell damage relating to oxidative stress and all these other inflammatory things that occur. And ultimately what can happen is we can lead to earlier, more progressive development of atherosclerotic disease or plaque buildup in the arteries along with this fibrotic uh, tissue that leads to this occlusion, which can cause symptoms or heart attack. And you can imagine this is not just for arteries. This could be any, any tissue. The inflammation I mentioned of the sac around the heart, the heart muscle itself, or even the valves, if they're in the field of view, all of those things can be damaged by the radiation. But again, radiation, chemotherapy, in the setting of breast cancer, these are necessary evils. And not just breast cancer, any cancer for that matter. Another busy slide that I'm not going to go through all the details, just to show you that radiation can lead to various uh, different effects uh, on the cardiovascular system, whether it's uh, myocardial ischemia, like I mentioned, uh, valve problems, all of which can progress to the development of heart failure down the line if we're not paying attention to it. Let's go back to uh, bring in this importance of cardiovascular risk factors again. So these graphs show you that here, uh, if you look at the one on your left, the percent of a major cardiovascular event in someone who has received radiation therapy, it's just like the anthracyclines, the higher the dose to the heart, so this is a graph of the mean dose of radiation to the heart, the higher the dose to the heart, the more likely it is that it's going to be damaged. And you have to also take into account, looking at these two graphs, two different cardiovascular outcomes, but if you add in cardiovascular risk factors, you can see how adding risk factors and adding age and adding radiation exposure can increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. This is a similar graph that shows who's at risk for radiation-induced heart disease. Again, similar concept to the anthracyclines and the Herceptin patients. The higher the dose, uh, if it includes the heart, concomitant therapy with, with medications, but again here, we've seen, I've de uh, demonstrated it in just the slide before, cardiovascular risk factor management becomes extremely important. And radiation, again, I mentioned already, it's a necessary evil. You can see that uh, patients in this slide, this is a slide showing the five, in five-year cancer survivors, these numbers are in the millions. This graph right here shows all those cancer survivors who received radiation. So obviously that graph is going in the right direction. There's more and more and more five-year cancer survivors. And look at the graph in breast cancer alone. Using radiation treatment has, has uh, along with whatever other therapies are indicated, uh, has shown to have significant impacts in survival. So it's something that has to be done. We just have to kind of mitigate the effects on the cardiovascular system. So let's talk about cardiovascular risk factors and, and, and talk a little bit more about patients who are at risk for cardiotoxicity. So this is now where I start to introduce the concept of the oncologist and the cardiologist working together. So this graph comes out of a guideline from the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. So they recognize that cardiovascular dysfunction is a significant side effect that their patients need to have uh, monitored uh, and that we need to try and um, affect along the course of their treatment uh, and they've developed this kind of guideline recommendation uh, that they follow and we and we follow as well. So they have kind of five different stages uh, that uh, go along with 
um, cancer and cardiovascular disease. At the beginning, when the cancer diagnosis is made, we really need to work together to identify which cancer patients are at increased risk for developing any kind of cardiac dysfunction. After um, there, I won't get into the research uh, that goes along with this because that was uh, that's like two or three lectures in itself. Um, there's research that's been ongoing to identify if there's any kind of preventative or monitoring strategies that can be done before uh, treatment starts to identify patients who might be at increased risk before starting cancer treatment. Once we start cancer treatment, then the focus shifts to which strategies can we employ to minimize risk during uh, uh, treatment with potentially cardiotoxic drugs. We also then need to focus on what are the per, um, preferred surveillance or monitoring approaches, whether it's echocardiography, blood work, EKGs, things like that, to try and identify patients who may or may not be developing cardiac dysfunction as the treatment is going on. And then when treatment is over, we, we can't just forget, we can't say, oh, they're a cancer survivor, we're good. We still have to follow these patients over time because we need to be monitoring and surveilling whether or not they're going to have any late effects of their treatment on the cardiovascular system. So this was, a, this was kind of a big deal to have uh, an oncology, uh, a group of oncologists put a guideline out to say cardiovascular dysfunction in our patients is the real deal and we really have to be paying attention to it and what can we do along the course of treatment in our patients to improve that. So cardiotoxicity is thought to happen because of this multiple hit hypothesis. So what ends up happening is, and this, this, goes, this slide highlights breast cancer diagnosis, but it could really be for any cancer for that matter. Some patients already have increased baseline cardiovascular risks. Then you throw on the other hit being the direct effects of the treatment. Then you throw in the other modifiable risk factors that may come along the way. You put these together, it causes a decrease in their cardiovascular reserve, and then they end up developing uh, cardiovascular disease in the long run. Cardiovascular disease and breast cancer also share a lot of risk factors. And you can see by the overlap of these two circles that these are, I mean, relatively common things. Age, we can't really do anything about. Everyone in this room is gonna get older. Um, our diet, although you guys are eating nice salads, but some of us don't have uh, the best diet uh, around. And definitely in the U.S., uh, our diet, uh, we, we have the highest uh, obesity rates, so we should probably need to work on that also. Family history, you can't change either. You got your genes from mom and dad, and that's what you got. Uh, but there are some other things on here that we can change, and you can see that the list is long, but these two are related, and I'm going to show you a couple other slides uh, that hammer home that point. The traditional risk factors for cardiovascular disease, I reviewed them at the beginning, so we'll review them again here. Diabetes tobacco uh, use, being obese or being overweight, lack of physical activity, developing high blood pressure or hypertension, and dyslipidemia or high cholesterol. Some things that are specific to women, and why I like this slide, is that there are other things that women get that may be emerging or other cardiovascular risk factors that are not in the male population. But I also want to highlight here that this slide specifically mentions breast cancer treatment. So that's an, an added risk uh, to the traditional atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk factors. That's what ASCVD stands for. Um, so just keep that in mind as well, that uh, someone who is not only female, who may have had some of these other things, but then develops breast cancer and undergoes treatment, they have added risk factors compared to the rest of us. Now, why is this important here where we live? Well, look at the maps, okay? This map here is heart disease related death between 2013 and 2015. Here we are. I'm never going to be without a job as long as I don't move somewhere over here. <laughs> so highest rates of cardiovascular disease death in our region in the entire nation. What about high blood pressure? Well, here's from 2017, adults over the age of 20. Well, you can imagine, again, we win. Here's obesity levels. I guess I'll, I'll just start circling the darkest parts of the map. And then here, the last one is documented physical inactivity. Now, this is a, a little bit older slide, 2011, but again, adults over 20 years of age. And I'm going to bring this one out specifically because I'm going to spend a little time on physical fitness at the end. Uh, physical inactivity, so we're, we have high blood pressure, we're fat, and we're lazy. So this is important in our, in our region, uh, so we really want to pay attention to these things. 
Now, we have some, some neat tools that we can use to kind of look at someone's overall cardiovascular disease risk. And, and your doctors or cardiologists or you know, general practitioners may have used this uh, on you already, whether you know it or not. Uh, we can look at things like your age, your sex, your race, some of your cholesterol numbers, your blood pressure, some of your other cardiovascular risks to decide what's your 10-year and lifetime risk of developing cardiovascular disease. So why did I put this slide on here? What's missing from this slide? Anybody? There's nothing on here on our traditional calculators about breast cancer or any other cancer treatment for that matter. So those patients aren't included in these big studies when they develop these calculators. We don't take into account someone who's had cardiovascular disease, radiation to the heart, or, or sorry, cancer treatment, radiation to the heart on its overall effect on their cardiovascular disease outcome. So this is just based on traditional risk factors. So I just wanted to point that out because uh, I think it's important as we, as we go through the rest of the talk to kind of focus in on, you know, the cancer patient may not be the same as your traditional patient without cancer as it uh, pertains to cardiovascular risk over time. We also know from this uh, big giant study of over 13,000 patients in, in four uh, different U.S. counties, um, they followed patients over a course of from 1987 to 2006, and I know this graphic doesn't project very well, but I'll explain how this graphic works here in a minute. What they looked at is the American Heart Association's what they call the simple seven, so seven different risk factors, obesity, diabetes, smoking, physical activity or lack thereof, high blood pressure, diabetes, or um, dyslipidemia, and whether or not they uh, per participated in a healthy diet. And what they looked at over time is how many of these risk factors were present and how many of those patients went on to develop different types of malignancies. So you can see that the more risk factors you develop, the more likely you are to develop some other kind of malignancy compared to someone who has really all their risk factors in check. So this graphic just goes to show you that it's not necessarily related to the therapy itself, that the more problems that we have, the more health problems that we develop, may actually put us at higher risk of developing cancer in the first place. And this is just specifically cardiovascular disease risk factors. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the specific risk factors that I've already mentioned. One common risk factor I already mentioned is age. And I think these two, uh, again, we can't fight it, but they go hand in hand. The most common or the, the average age of breast cancer diagnosis is around 62 years old. And again, that's around the same time that women would develop cardiovascular disease anyway. So obviously these two things, uh, if you look at just those numbers, they're kind of coming to a head at the same time. As far as diabetes goes, I think in any patient, especially someone who's being treated for cancer, uh, breast cancer or otherwise, it really needs to be something that the labs are monitored frequently. Many times breast cancer or cancer patients are getting labs very routinely to look for other things. We really need to be watching their blood sugars. If they have diabetes, making sure that their hemoglobin A1Cs are controlled. That's the number that we look at to monitor blood sugar control over a period of time. And this is kind of just an outline of uh, the criteria for both the diagnosis of diabetes and also uh, some other risk factors or when we should test patients. I would argue that anybody who's being treated for um, malignancy or has risk factors for cardiovascular disease needs to be um, screened uh, for diabetes. Now, as far as the treatment, if you came to see me in my clinic, diabetes medications, just like everything else, they're kind of exploding at the moment. There's so many coming out. They're all on TV. I can't keep up with them all, so I'm so thankful that I have endocrinologists and primary care providers who can see my patients more often than I can see them to help them get their blood sugars under control. So I often defer these patients to my, to my other colleagues because they know better how to deal with these things than I do. But we really want to be making sure we're following the blood sugar being aggressive with its control. Diabetes is essentially an equivalent to cardio, uh, coronary artery disease. So if you have diabetes, a lot of our guidelines focus uh, us on treating you as if you had coronary artery disease, even if we've never proven it. So it's very important to keep diabetes under control. And we do that with uh, a plethora of medications, whether they're injectable or pill form. Um, insulin, obviously, has is, is been around for a long time. And diet management and exercise, also very important. High blood pressure, we just recently came out with some new guidelines uh, where the numbers, and you probably have either heard about it from your doctor 
or heard about it from someone else who just told you, well, I was controlled until a couple months ago when my doctor said now my blood pressure needs to be lower. So now the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology have come out with this cutoff of about 130 over 80 millimeters of mercury or less. That's kind of the target blood pressure goal at this point. But that, that document or that recommendation also comes with it, the impetus to do non-pharmacologic things like diet changes, exercise, monitoring blood pressure at home, all of these things that all of our patients and specifically maybe cancer patients should be doing also so that we can pick up on the development of high blood pressure sooner. You also see that on this graphic, if you were to follow the algorithm, which I'm not going to go through every step, it just kind of shows you the different stages of blood pressure and what we do for these. And we always start with the non-pharmacologic therapies that I mentioned because that improves your overall health anyway. We focus a lot on that ASCVD risk score to decide which patients have a higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease and those patients may need to be uh, treated sooner when their blood pressure starts to rise. And again, remember that graph or that, a, that calculator does not include the, the patient who's being treated for malignancy. So blood pressure management, very important. I don't have this graphic in this talk. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, um, uh, a very sad graphic uh, if you look at the data that comes from children. The development of high blood pressure in a, cancer, a childhood cancer survivor actually increases their chance of developing cardiovascular disease, specifically heart failure, later on in their lifetime, maybe by the age of 40 or 50 years old, exponentially. I mean, just the development of a very routine thing, very, uh, you know, a very classic risk factor, a very classic disease process that we deal with every day. If a child who survives cancer develops that, their risk of having cardiovascular disease is just skyrockets. So very important to be monitoring folks, uh, especially after they've uh, been cured of their malignancy. So how do we do that? Well, the non-pharmacologic ways I talked about, if you employ weight loss, you might be able to drop your blood pressure about five millimeters of mercury. The DASH diet, which is dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. I'll show you a slide that kind of breaks down that diet. If you employ that, which is essentially a low salt diet, you can drop an 11 millimeters of mercury. Cutting down on your salt intake is important. Aerobic activity is very important. I'll talk about that in the physical fitness section. Decreasing your alcohol intake uh, if you drink a lot. And then obviously with medications, this is just a list of the different medications that we can use to treat blood pressure. And many of the doctors uh, that treat uh, patients have them on a combination of this list of medications uh, to get people's blood pressure controlled. So if any of you have blood pressure problems, you're probably on one of these classes of medications sitting here today. So this is the DASH diet. You can look this up on the internet. It's pretty easy. That's where I got this uh, graphic from. Uh, this just kind of shows you you're really looking at a diet that's heavy in grains and vegetables and fruits and cutting down kind of the sweets and fats uh, and really cutting down on things that are also high in sodium. So adopting this kind of a diet, uh, it's funny because it doesn't have anything to do with Mrs. Dash, which is, which is a salt substitute, but almost everybody thinks that they're the same thing, but they're, they're completely not. But if Mrs. Dash came after this, that was pretty, pretty ingenious uh, marketing. Um, but anyway, this is a totally different thing. So uh, just a healthy approach to the diet uh, to help control blood pressure. And you don't have to have high blood pressure to employ this diet. It's an overall healthy diet anyway, so it might actually prevent you from developing um, high blood pressure. What about high cholesterol? So we just actually had a guideline update uh, as far as uh, in the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association go. Uh, they really focus again uh, on that clinical atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease risk. If you already have heart disease, plaque in your coronary arteries, you obviously have to have your cholesterol controlled no matter what the number is because even if it's normal, it's putting plaque in places it doesn't belong uh, or your body is putting it in places it doesn't belong. As far as prevention, when we look at primary prevention, that's when we start looking at the, the bad cholesterol or the LDL number and we start focusing on your other risk factors, your ASCVD risk score, and then decide what strength of cholesterol medicine you might need. And then depending, you can see here, we break it down uh, into these categories here. And most of the time, people end up on a moderate or high intensity statin, and some like Lipitor, Crestor, Atorvastatin, or Rosuvastatin, respectively, uh, or other cholesterol medicines. And then other patients, we can just focus on lifestyle diet uh, modifications before having to treat them. But again, remember, the risk calculators and things that are being employed for these guidelines do not include patients who are receiving cancer treatments. 
pretty much uh, beating a dead horse here as far as what we can do non-pharmacologically for these risk factors and hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol is no different. Healthy diet, exercise, all the same things apply. And this graphic here just shows you the different uh, intensities of the cholesterol medicine that if you end up needing one that your physician may choose to say, all right, I'm on a high intensity statin, these are these doses, uh, moderate intensity statin or low intensity statin. So we base your intensity on what kind of disease process is present, what your risk factors are uh, as we go forth and treat you. But we really want to be focusing again on all the cardiovascular disease risk factors. Smoking, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's a very prevalent thing. Uh, I don't do it service because I only have one slide here because the answer is simple, just don't do it. You shouldn't smoke. Um, you know, I wish my mom would have listened to me, but uh, she didn't. Um, so now there are many different options. I think willpower is the most important. You have to understand that you're not doing yourself any favors by smoking. Uh, so you should, once you're ready to do it and you have your mindset right, uh, it should be easy to quit. There are many different options. Uh, I say that, that was, that was sarcasm. It's really not that easy to quit, I know. Uh, there are many patients struggle with this all the time. Um, nicotine replacement patches, gums, different medications can be used. Behavioral uh, 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 cessation programs, some people can do it cold turkey. Uh, however you want to do it, if you smoke, just do it. Just get rid of it. It's your one biggest modifiable risk factor uh, that uh, leads you to progression or development of cardiovascular disease, irrespective of whether or not uh, you have cancer or not. And obviously, there are links between cigarette smoking and different types of cancers, if you didn't already know that. Weight management, this one's pretty easy. You should balance your physical activity with caloric intake. Uh, the appropriate body weight, you don't want to be too skinny, but you don't want to be too round. So the, the body mass index kind of target is less than 25 uh, kilograms per meter squared. Uh, make sure that you don't weigh yourself in the morning with a wet towel on, that's not gonna help you. Um, but uh, just, some, just some comic relief there. Let's talk uh, a little bit about physical fitness as we come towards the latter half or the latter part of the talk. Physical fitness, which is uh, one of the main things that that physician from the video spoke of at the conference and one of the main things that she does in her <laughs> clinic. Physical fitness, we don't think about it, but it's very, very important as far as cardiovascular disease and as far as how your survival and how you maybe live with or deal with your cancer diagnosis. Uh, if you look at these two graphs here, looking at um, both time to exhaustion of exercise, only in seconds, mind you, and peak METs, or the metabolic equivalence of exercise, so this is how we kind of gauge how much exercise equals so many METs, um, so we can kind of see how vigorous your activity level and we assign a number. Compared to someone who does not have cancer, so we call these patients a control patient, so compared to a control patient, someone who has surgery for their malignancy only, well, they, they don't have this big drop off as far as their physical fitness goes. You can see both, both graphs are essentially equal on both of these charts. If we do one additional modality of treatment for your cancer, you can see that it starts to drop. And then if we add multiple modalities, whether it's radiation, different medications, et cetera, you can see that the cardiovascular fitness in these patients receiving multiple modalities is significantly different than the patient who is in the control group who does not get exposed to any of these things. So what about long-term survival? Well, looking at the graphs here on your right, the overall survival probability, looking at both what VO2 max is a way that we can scientifically see how cardiovascularly fit you are and how well you exercise. So both of these graphs are very similar in that this one looks at VO2 max, this one looks at your METs or the amount of exercise. And you can see that those people who have better, um, sorry, those, yeah, those people who have better exercise capacity actually pretend a, long, a longer term survival than their counterparts who exercise uh, at peak cardio, cardiorespiratory fitness or who do less exercise overall. So exercise is extremely important. And this was one of the most kind of sobering slides that uh, Dr. Gilchrist shared in her talk uh, a few uh, weeks ago. If you look at, again, comparing someone to a healthy control patient, so this is looking at exercise in patients who have not ever been exposed to chemotherapy or radiation. This is your VO2 max on average for a 70-year-old patient, 19.3. If you have received chemotherapy or radiation, 
and you're 50 years old, your number is the same as a healthy 70 year old. So when they mentioned in the video about gaining 30 pounds and decreased cardiac or physical fitness, this is what they're talking about. Patients can gain weight because of being inactive. Cancer treatment can make people not feel that good. They don't want to get up and move around, but it's very, very important to keep your physical fitness going throughout treatment, and then especially when you're done and you feel up to it, even though you may have already had some downtrend, you really need to focus on getting physically fit again. And I think there's a lot of research and a lot of data coming out about the importance of physical fitness programs after uh, cancer treatment. But this, this was just staggering to me that just getting treatment for cancer can, can cause a 50-year-old female to behave physically like a 70-year-old female who has never been exposed to treatment. So just to, to, to hammer home the point, as far as survival in years of follow-up after treatment, if you have high cardio, cardiorespiratory fitness, your chances of survival are higher than someone who has low or moderate um, cardiorespiratory fitness. So just another graphic representation to show you how important exercise is. So what kind of exercise are we talking about? Well, moderate and vigorous exercise have kind of two different definitions. You can imagine the more vigorous your exercise, maybe the less amount of time you have to do it. Moderate exercise for anybody, not just cancer patients, from a cardiovascular perspective, we recommend at least 150 minutes per week. If it's vigorous exercise, you can cut it down to 75 minutes per week. We also recommend muscle strengthening activities included in that, so about two or more days a week, and you can do all major muscle groups. If you're really targeting weight loss, you want to shoot for 60 to 90 minutes of at least moderate intensity exercise most, if not all, days of the week. So how do you define, how do you know what kind of exercise you're doing? So moderate intensity exercise, this is an activity that will raise your heart rate, you'll break a, and you'll break a sweat, you might be able to talk to someone, so you might be walking down the street with a friend, but you won't be able to sing your favorite song. You'll be winded enough that you can't carry a tune. So this is walking fast, water aerobics, riding a bike, stuff like that. Vigorous intensity is obviously you're breathing harder and faster, your heart rate is going up even more significantly than moderate intensity exercise, and you really won't be able to say more than a few words before uh, pausing to take a breath. So things like jogging, running, swimming uh, laps, riding your bike faster, singles, tennis, uh, or playing basketball are some examples of vigorous uh, intensity activity. So in summary, this is just a graphic to kind of summarize. We talked about a lot of cardiovascular disease risk factors. Uh, this kind of gives you some, this is an older slide, so, but in a nutshell, it gives you some of the goals of things that we want to improve. We want to make sure your cholesterol is controlled. We want to make sure your blood pressure is at target, making sure your uh, blood sugar is where it needs to be, body weight is at where it needs to be, you're doing the right amount of exercise and employing a healthy, nutritious diet, regardless of whether it's for cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, or any cancer treatment, or the combination of both. The, the, at, this came from a group out of Vanderbilt. They actually have a, a fellowship, and there's many of them for uh, cardio-oncology uh, research and, 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 um, and teaching. They, they kind of identified this A, B, C, D, E approach for the patient uh, as it relates to prevention of heart disease in breast cancer patients. So if you look here at their kind of algorithm that they have, uh, A stands for your awareness of risks of heart disease, so that's important. You should always know uh, what kind of risk factors you have. And if you're an appropriate patient, cardiovascular disease or what have you, the use of aspirin may be, may be uh, something to consider. We talked a lot about blood pressure management, so that's what B stands for. C, cholesterol and cigarette uh, cessation. Uh, D is for diet and weight management. If I can hammer one other thing home to anybody, especially if anyone who knows a child who has had exposure to chemotherapy who wouldn't otherwise pay attention to these things, knowing not only your medication that you received and the dose of that medication you received can be extremely important down the line should you need to see a cardiologist specifically. Because a lot of times patients come and they say, well, I got the red devil, but I don't know how much. Or I got radiation, but I don't know how much went into my heart. I know there's a lot of things going on during therapy for cancer and you don't want to pay attention to those things. But when you're done, you should really go back and ask those questions so that you can keep it in your back pocket for later because it may come back and be an important number down the line. So knowing your dose of chemo or radiation is important. Diabetes treatment, so there's a lot of Ds. 
Uh, and then E, exercise, and then the use of echocardiography. Uh, many patients who are getting these medications uh, for breast cancer will need surveillance echocardiograms at various intervals uh, depending on the treatment regimen. And that's where uh, one of the areas that we come in as cardiologists to read those studies uh, on these patients. Now this is again a really busy slide and it's just to remind me to tell you that we are still working towards developing a good risk assessment tool that can be used kind of broadly or even within certain cancer types in adults or even in kids for that matter. These, are not, these have not really been validated but people are working, uh, looking towards kind of coming up with a new uh, risk scoring system that can be pretty universal. Um, but again, this kind of summarizes what we talked about. If you received certain medications, especially in high doses, along with uh, radiation therapy, you, and these are different medications that can be used in breast cancer treatments uh, and other cancers uh, for that matter. Uh, obviously, I hammered home the point of cardiovascular disease risk factors. So looking at your combined risk factor profile, uh, you can kind of decide where you fall in this scheme, although uh, this one that I'm showing you not yet been validated in big, large studies. But in a summary, you really should, again, know your medications and the types, the cumulative doses if you can, know about your radiation treatment, and then know your, your patient risk. What's your age when you started treatment, what gender, obviously, uh, and your cardiovascular disease risk factors. So uh, just to summarize cardiovascular disease and breast cancer, in a huge registry of breast cancer patients, almost 100,000, we know that cardiovascular disease is, is pivotal in the survival of breast cancer patients. If you're a survivor greater than 66 years old and you're more than five years into survivorship, in the long term, cardiovascular disease is what's gonna get you, not your breast cancer. So why do all that work and survive your breast cancer and then forget about the rest? you really need to focus on the risk factors and not developing cardiovascular disease because you might be at risk of developing it sooner. Patients with prior cardiovascular disease, again, those patients still with a higher survival rate than years past as far as breast cancer goes, but again, cardiovascular mortality is gonna get them, maybe not by much, a couple of percentage points, but after 10 years after treatment, cardiovascular disease stills, still wins uh, as far as mortality goes in the breast cancer patient. So in the closing minutes, I want to talk about what is cardio-oncology. <coughs> so in this kind of, uh, this talk hopefully brings to the forefront that over the past couple of years, there's really been this uh, development of a relationship between cardiologists and oncologists. Uh, we really need to be working with each of our patients uh, individually and then as cancer types as a whole. Uh, so that we can improve their outcomes both on the cancer front and on the cardiovascular disease front. So it all obviously centers around patient care. We can have all of these cardiovascular health and risk factors that we spent today talking about. We can have the cancer treatment risk factors alone, the toxicities uh, therein, so that's the patient here. And then these other things that surround the patient uh, as far as basic clinical research that needs to be ongoing. I'll take this point, uh, this moment as a plug for all the pe people who are doing research to look at what kind of imaging studies can we do. Uh, I work with one of the PhDs on campus, Dr. Carr, uh, who has an MRI algorithm that we can look and see if we can identify uh, abnormalities and how the heart muscle is moving before the patient actually has a decline in their pump function to maybe allow us to intervene sooner with some other medications and things to maybe prevent the development of dysfunction. There's also been lots of research, none that I showed you today because uh, of the time allotments, but there's also things taking normal heart failure therapies and normal cardiovascular therapies and trying to apply them to these patient populations to see if, well, what if we add a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor or this medicine or that medicine to see if we can reduce or mitigate the risks from the breast cancer treatment itself or any, any cancer treatment. Obviously, big clinical trials looking at the safety data. A lot of clinical trials will now specifically have uh, uh, someone looking at the cardiovascular safety of these new and emerging cancer treatments. 
um, we, all of these registries and long-term studies on cancer survivors so that we can continue to close knowledge gaps and gain information about how these patients are going to do, especially kids, as they live into adulthood now with uh, being cured of their malignancies. And obviously training the future generations of doctors to pay attention to, you know, this patient you have in your clinic had cancer. Yes, they might have been done with their cancer treatment 10 years ago, but you still have to look at their risk factors and ask the questions. So the cardio-oncology team is someone who has a specific interest in uh, this relationship. That would be me in our uh, clinic. Um, the, some of these larger centers will have other uh, associated providers or uh, other, say, nurse practitioners and other advanced practice providers who will work along with the physicians to coordinate care between oncology uh, and cardiology. I work closely with some of the oncologists at Mitchell, uh, taking care of their patients jointly. Obviously, we have family, friends, and social support on, and, and hospital services on one side, but look at all the other people it takes uh, to work this, uh, this kind of relationship, all to benefit the cancer patient and their outcome, uh, ultimately. This is just a list of some of the cardio-oncology clinics. This is not an up-to-date list. I think it's about two years old now, uh, 2017, showing you that there are many clinics across the country that specifically uh, identify themselves as clinics who work tailoring their, uh, their work towards the unique cardiovascular needs of cancer patients. I took the liberty of adding the star for USA Health. I also felt I should add the star to promote Alabama in general. Here's Birmingham and I've already been in contact or have been contacted by a cardio-oncologist who, who has set up a cardio-oncology clinic uh, at UAB so that over time we can work together, not only so that we could do it regionally, that we could do it uh, and improve cardiovascular outcomes in cancer patients across the state. So there's our plug for, for our clinic here. Uh, the research is exploding. This is a growing field. This is, if you look at when you type into what doctors use, PubMed, this is when you look up all kinds of different research. Look at back at the 60s when you typed in cardio-oncology, you got next to nothing. Now this is a graph that stopped April 14th of 2015, so ignore this one in 2015. Look at this, just skyrocketing. The awareness of the interaction, the research that's going on in this field, it's just, it's exploding uh, and it cha it's changing every day. It's, it's actually, it's an amazing thing. So much so that the American College of Cardiology, we identify these subsections uh, that you can belong to if you specifically want information or want to contribute to uh, the knowledge or the knowledge gaps. You can see that they're recognizing a cardio-oncology section. And there's actually an international society for cardio-oncology as well. So we can partner with our, our uh, colleagues across the world uh, to put this information uh, together and out there for our patients. So who should be referred to cardio-oncology? So we're back to our slide where we're showing this, uh, the oncologist recognizing that cardiovascular disease is an issue. So any newly diagnosed patient who's gonna have, who has existing CVD risk factors or cardiovascular disease risk factors uh, who will receive potentially toxic therapy, those who develop cardiac disease or cardiac toxic side effects during treatment, and especially those survivors if they've been exposed to cardiotoxic chemotherapy or radiation, to promote their overall long-term wellness. The goals of the program, improving outcomes per patient with cancer and cardiac disease, providing earlier detection and cardio, for, of cardiotoxic side effects. I mentioned the MRI study. There's also many other uh, imaging uh, modalities that are being looked at. To prevent, reduce, or reverse further cardiac damage in someone who has unfortunately had cardiotoxic effects, monitor these patients who are receiving therapy, better understanding their cardiac issues because the cancer patient may be vastly different than our routine uh, cardiovascular disease patient. And then to try and eliminate cardiovascular disease as any barrier to someone who's gonna go through cancer treatment and survive their cancer or live with their cancer. I'll be darned if you're gonna die on my watch uh, after you've gone through all that and then we ignore the rest and then cardiovascular disease gets you earlier than it may have otherwise gotten you. So. In summary, hopefully I showed you there's clearly a relationship between cardiovascular disease and breast cancer, between the risk factors, the therapy itself, and obviously how they impact outcomes. Really preventing and minimizing cardiotoxicity is what we have to do as the goal and the joint relationship between our two specialties to identify patients who are at risk, mitigate this risk during treatment, 
and, and deliver optimal medical therapy as prevention and treatment strategy, strategies continue to evolve. And then the importance of this booming subspecialty within our practices to really empower you guys, not to scare you with data like this to say, oh, well, you survived cancer. Well, guess what? Heart disease is going to get you. That's not the idea. The idea is to empower you so that you also can pay attention to your risk factors and modify them to the best of your ability along with your uh, doctors uh, and, and other healthcare providers. So hopefully, over this last hour, uh, you've kind of gained some, some knowledge about the relationship. Again, I hope I didn't scare any of you who raised your hand at the beginning, um, but now I'll open the floor to take any specific questions uh, that you might have. Go ahead. If you, if you go back to the slide, they have some side effects that have been documented in their, when they were in development and then as patients are being followed. As far as heart failure or cardiomyopathy goes, like with the doxorubicin and the Herceptins, they're not known to cause that type of cardiovascular side effect to the degree that those other ones that I mentioned are. But all, if you, if, this is a very generic statement, but if you look up almost every cancer medication that's out there, whether it's uh, for uh, endocrine treatment of uh, those that are endocrine receptor positive breast cancers you're talking about, uh, and any other type of cancer for that matter, if you look up the, the chemotherapeutic agent, some cardiovascular side effect has probably been listed in the side effect profile. It's just that certain ones, like the ones I highlighted today, are the ones that people have really noticed and have focused on over time, and obviously we have the most information about those. But almost every single therapy that you take lists something in there. So yes, the answer ultimately is yes, but maybe not to the degree that I talked about with these other ones. Ben? Can you talk about uh, the heart is in the field of radiation where it's been treated, so obviously if you have left breast. Right. But if you have right breast radiation, is, is it also hitting arteries and key things going into the heart? Yes, any, anything in the field of radiation can be uh, uh, affected. So what they do, is, in, in, and again, I'm, I'm speaking out of the scope of my practice, but I know that with radiation treatment, they have done various things as far as positioning patients differently, localizing the beams of radiation to target just specifically what they're looking at. Anything in that field can be affected, whether it's another artery on this side. All the arteries that feed the heart with blood, they really come right around the heart. So there's not going to be something over here that's necessarily going to eventually affect the, the heart itself. But again, there are blood vessels over here that can cause damage to those blood vessels and other tissues in the area, but they really do, the radiation oncologists, they have developed a lot of different strategies over the years that they can really limit the amount of exposure to tissue outside of their interest area. So they've done a really good job with that, but. Lo Locally, and so most of the data unfortunately comes from kids uh, because places like St. Jude, they have childhood cancer survivorship studies, and this is like a huge number, unfortunately, it's a huge number of patients, and they follow them for their lifetime. We don't have the same sort of robust data for adult cancer survivors, although people are starting to gather that data. There are that's why some of the, I didn't mention it in this talk, but some of the therapies that we use, um, sometimes we use them anecdotally because it, the study was kind of small, and, and it, but it showed that there might be a benefit, although maybe it wasn't a big enough study to be statistically significant, which is something we look for in research studies. So we kind of use the information and kind of tailor our treatments, and, and over time, yes, the answer is going to be with this boom of cardio-oncology, this stuff is going to be looked at and is going to be tracked and is probably currently being tracked in various places. Here locally, to my knowledge, I mean, I'm sure there are cardiologists in the area that take care of patients who have cancer. Yeah. As far as I know, I'm the only one that has a very specific interest in this. I can tell you I'm very early on and I don't have a research study like that myself going. Um, maybe that's something that, say, UAB and, and myself or along with Mitchell and other places we can you know, kind of develop a registry of sorts to follow our patients. 
you know, but there's a lot, this is, to get a real good glimpse of how this is really gonna play out, I think most of these larger cancer centers and even smaller or medium-sized cancer centers really need to pool all of their information so that we can just get it all together in one place and analyze it and do it that way rather than have, you know, University of South Alabama have a study that's just looking at our patients. I think that would do a disservice to, to everybody because we don't want that patient pool to have a lot of patients in it too fast because that means they all have cancer of some sort. So I think uh, doing those sorts of efforts is, is kind of where cardio-oncology is going. Uh, so, and, again, and again, you can see by that slide I showed you that, that the research in this field, various types, is, is clearly booming. So. Why aren't, aren't the other hospitals or oncologists why are they pushing this? Yeah. Well, I, you can imagine that. Uh, so, to go back to the, the one part of your statement, you can imagine that when you get the diagnosis of breast cancer, and they show you, or any cancer, and they show you the list of medicines you're going to get, and the list of side effects, that you're not really you're not focused on that because you just got a diagnosis you didn't ever want. So most people forget about that stuff. They get through their treatment, they get through all that. So a lot of it is just, you know, both patient awareness and physician awareness. Not everyone knows about these relationships that are present. Uh, and cardiologists do for certain, uh, some of these classic drugs. I mean, we know they're on board exams. We take anthracycline questions and Herceptin questions, but the, the big thing is gonna be even the newer agents that are coming out like wildfire. There, there's just always something new and you see commercials for them all the time. We really, you really need to be focused on what that medication is gonna do. So you really just have to have an invested awareness as, as a cardiologist or a general practice provider to really know that, okay, this patient has certain risks that someone else doesn't have. And, and not to generalize, but some cancer patients, depending on how, how they're, what type of cancer they have, what they're receiving, they can be relatively complex. And in some scenarios, that complexity is scary for a subspecialist like a cardiologist. You want to focus on the cardiovascular stuff and then, then the rest of it, you know, but all these interactions between things can get pretty hairy sometimes. Uh, and so I think that that's part of it probably lower on, 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 on the totem pole. I think awareness, I, I think, I can tell you that this cardio-oncology stuff, as things evolve, more and more places are actually adding someone that's, okay, I want you to focus on this. So there are clinics, not necessarily here in town, but you know, in other places that say, I'm gonna add a cardio or a cardiologist who I'm gonna let specifically manage this, these types of patients. So I think all of that's going to evolve. Uh, obviously, with me, it's evolving here. So hopefully, um, I can provide something to this overarching goal of improving the care of these patients. Uh, we have a good cardiovascular program. We have a great cancer program. I don't see why it wouldn't work and work well here. So, any other questions? Go ahead. Does mitral valve prolapse? Does that figure into the risk factors? Oh, that's a tricky one. Uh, it depends because uh, a lot of patients have the diagnosis of mitral valve prolapse and it may have been made many years ago before our imaging got really good enough to know what the mitral valve actually looks like. It's not really a flat structure. It kind of bows a little bit to begin with. Um, so the criteria have actually changed for mitral valve prolapse, but many women carry that diagnosis from their 20s and 30s um, that really don't actually have true mitral valve prolapse. Um, in the grand scheme of things, if it, it, even if it were mild, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Although if you have radiation to, to the heart and the mitral valve is involved and your mitral valve prolapses and leaks, I guess it's possible that if any other further damage to the mitral valve occurs, that you could get more leakage associated with the prolapse. But I would really first go back and say, do, do I really have the diagnosis of mitral valve prolapse like the, like the echo criteria suggest? Or did I just get that diagnosis years ago that's kind of stuck with, stuck with, and that happens to many, many women. They come, they have that in their history, and we do an echo, and they clearly don't have it anymore, so. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.